with Jesus. I think we're losing some youngsters here. I was telling Charity, I uh, usually I'm kind of thinking by uh, Tuesday what I want to talk about on Sunday. And um, Friday night, I was going, whoa, <laughs> hello, <laughs> anybody up there? And uh, so I use it on. I can't hear me here. Can you all hear me? Well, hello. Got it on now? Huh? We got a new sound system, and so it's a little weird. What do you think now? Can you hear me back there? Gene, you hear me? So the only word I had all week was covenant, and then the Lord began to talk to me about that and uh, began reading up on it. So we really got to get this fixed. Is it okay now? If it is, then stop doing that. Driving me crazy. Short trip. Good. Is that okay? All right. So I'm going to go kind of all over the place. Genesis 14, 15, 21, 26, Hebrews 9, Proverbs 18, and Psalm 50. So just don't worry. Let me talk. You can look me up later. See if I did it right. So there are at least three covenants. There's a whole lot more covenants, but there's three that we talk about a lot. There's a covenant with Abraham, there's a covenant with Moses, and then the new covenant through Jesus. And that's the one where we are and where we stand in victory and we stand in his love. Well, in the Old Testament days, a covenant was a way of keeping the peace between two people, two countries, two tribes, two nations. A conversation may have gone like this, one man speaking to another, you killed my brother, and I'm going to kill you. And the brother and the man says, well, you know your brother killed my brother. And if you kill me, my brothers will kill you. Is there a place that we can stop? Can we make a covenant of peace? And he might have said, because this was their custom and how they looked at things, he said, here, I've got a yearling bull. He's a prime bull ready to go to put out with the cattle. Let me take this bull and I'll kill him right here. And this blood will be a witness between you and me. And we'll roast some of this bull and we'll eat it. We'll break bread together and we'll fellowship to prove that you and I have a covenant of peace, that I won't harm you and you won't harm me. You see, it's, it's easy to shake hands. It's easy to say words. But when you take something valuable and destroy it in front of each other, you say how serious it is. And Psalm says, to make a covenant, there has to be a sacrifice. Every covenant that's talked of in the Old Testament and in the New, there was bloodshed. Our new covenant is based on better sacrifices, not on the blood of bulls and lambs, but the precious blood of Jesus. He is our sacrifice. So Abraham and Abimelech in Genesis 21, they swore an oath of peace. Abraham was getting very prosperous and Abimelech, king, king of the Philistines, was getting a little worried by this power living next door. And so they swore an oath of peace and Abraham gave, gave him seven lambs as a witness, and they ate together. He did it again. At, he did it twice with Abimelech, at Beersheba and also at Gerar. Well, then, again, the same Abimelech, now in chapter 26, saw how prosperous Isaac, the son of Abraham, was. Everywhere he went, everything prospered. All his crops grew, his, his cattle and his lambs reproduced. And so the same thing, he came to him and 
said, let us have a covenant of peace. They had run Isaac off because he was so big, but now they came because as he got bigger, they became afraid. And they came begging, let's make a covenant of peace. And so they killed animals and ate them and swore to each other, I won't harm you and you won't harm me. They cut a covenant. Well, back in Genesis 15, before Isaac was even born, God spoke to Abram and said, don't be afraid. I'm your shield and I'm your very great reward. We, to understand what that meant, what God meant by that, we have to go back a little bit to Genesis 14. You see, Abraham had just rescued his nephew Lot and all his possessions. Four kings warred against five kings, and one group or the other won. And anyway, the winners took Lot and all his possessions and all the possessions of those other kings and skedaddled off north toward Damascus. Well, Abraham heard that they had taken Lot, his nephew, and all his stuff and all his family. So Abraham gathered up all his men and set out against them. And you think, you know, what does Abraham have? Two or three hired hands? 318, the Bible says. Abraham was a rich man. He took all his men and pursued them. And when he came close, he divided his men into two groups and attacked from two sides and routed them, captured all the people, recaptured all the people, all the stuff, and brought it back home to Canaan. Well, on the way, he was met by a mysterious fellow named Melchizedek. He was called King of Salem, priest of God. Salem can be translated as righteousness or peace. King of peace, king of righteousness. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? He did a curious thing. He brought out bread and wine. Also sounds familiar. And he blessed Abraham. Whatever happened, whatever went on, it so moved Abraham that he gave a tenth of all the spoil. He had just defeated five kings. They had plunder of four other kings. There was many cattle, many sheep, much gold, many trinkets, and a whole lot of people. He gave Melchizedek a tenth. Nobody told him to. Nobody asked him to. He was moved to do that. So then he went on down the road a little further, and now the other kings whose stuff he was bringing and whose families he had in tow said they came begging, and they said, just give us the people. Give us our wives and our babies. You take the stuff. And Abraham said, no, I've already sworn to God. I won't take one thing from you. I don't want you to say that you made Abraham rich. He said, I won't take a shoestring from the stuff that I've captured. He gave it all back. You see, Abraham had been blessed by God. He knew about being rich. He knew about being blessed. He didn't want to trade the relationship he had with God, God who had blessed him, coming and going, made him the richest man in the region, the most powerful man in the region. He didn't want to trade that away for a bunch of cattle and a bunch of junk. He said no. Abraham knew that true blessings, lasting blessings, true riches, lasting riches only come from God. And in that blessing, Abraham had learned of God's faithfulness and his goodness. He wouldn't trade that. He said to them, keep your stuff. God has and will make me rich. After this, after all of this, now God spoke to Abraham and said, don't be afraid. I am your shield, and I am your great reward. Well, what was Abraham going to be afraid of? Well, back in those days, every spring, 
the kings of one tribe or another would get together with their buddies and go try to rape and pillage and conquer somebody. That's just what they did. So Abraham had just beaten a large group of them. But he knew that the next year they would try to come back. But God said, don't be afraid. You've done a great thing. You've done a selfless thing. I'm your shield. And I'm your plunder. I'm your reward. Another place in the Bible says that God is our portion. When you divide up the spoils, you each get a portion. Abraham gave all of it back. His portion was God. Well, then Abraham asked God, I am rich. You have blessed me, but what can, you, what can you give me that I don't already have? I have no child. I have no heir. Who will get all this stuff you've given me? He said, my heir is some cousin named Eliezer of Damascus, a servant in my household. And God spoke to him again and said, he will not be your heir, but you will have a son out of your own body that will be your heir. And you will have descendants that you can't count. He took him outside and said, look at the stars and count them if you can. It's quite a task. But God does that to us. We think we're pretty smart and we can't do one little thing that he asks us to do, like counting the stars. They find a new star every day, seems like. New galaxy of stars. So shall your descendants be like the number of the stars. You see, Abraham wanted more of God, wanted more of God's blessings. He'd had a glimpse of eternity. He wanted more than riches and comfort and pleasure in this life. He wanted into the future with God. He wanted eternal things. You see, it's sort of the opposite of the story Jesus told in Luke 12, 16. I forgot to tell you about Luke. I'm going there too. Jesus told about a rich man whose fields produced a bumper crop. And the man said, what will I do with all this grain? I don't have barns big enough to store it. So he said, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll bid, big, build bigger barns. And I'll store my grain. And then I'll say to myself, I have many good things for many years. I can take it easy. I can eat, drink, and be merry. And Jesus said that God said to the man, you fool. Your life will be demanded of you today. And who will receive all those things you've hoarded up and stored? And Jesus said, that's how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself and is not rich toward God. Abraham wanted to be rich toward God. He may have been the, most, the richest, the most prosperous man, the pow most powerful man in the region. Sounds like it. He had just defeated everybody in the countryside. But he wanted to be rich toward God. He knew there was more than just the stuff of this life. The things that everybody seems to seek, comfort, pleasure. And so when God told him about his offspring, as numerous as the stars in the sky, Abraham did the most important thing in his whole life. He believed God. There's maybe only one or two things more powerful in all the universe than believing God. Love, probably. God himself. Abraham believed God. But there's nothing impossible with God, and there's nothing impossible for those who believe God. There's nothing impossible with God, 
and there's nothing impossible to people who believe God. People kind of roll your eyes when you say stuff like that. Watch out, they're going to roll on the floor. I tell my daughters, don't roll your eyes at me. Okay. Then I realized who taught them. <clears throat> uh, it's, it, it comes factory equipment. It's hardwired in, that rolling your eyes thing. That's what the Bible says. That's what God says. Is God a liar? No. God says, believe me, and there is nothing impossible. If you don't believe that, if you don't see that, it's not God's fault. We need to believe. There is nothing impossible with God. How are you saved? You believe. How are you justified? By believing. How are you healed? By believing. How are you filled with the Holy Spirit? By believing. How are mountains moved? How are lives delivered? How do we put one foot in front of the other? By believing. In John 6, 29, Jesus tells people what the work of God is. What is the work that God requires? To believe in the one he sent. In 1 John, John elaborates a little more. These are the commandments of the new covenant. To believe that Jesus is the Son of God and to love each other as Jesus loved us. That's the whole thing of the new covenant. Abraham believed God. And what did God do in response? He credited it to him as righteousness. He put it into his account as righteousness. Sounds like we all have an account somewhere. It's a bank account. It's a checking account. Well, Abraham's account is full of righteousness because he believed. What's in your account? Was Abraham a sinner? Oh, yeah. There's nobody in the Bible except Jesus and God that didn't sin, and, and the Bible talks about it. Abraham lied a couple different times to get out of trouble. Told people his, he had a beautiful wife, and he'd go into a kingdom and say, no, she's not my wife, she's my sister. He was afraid they'd kill him to take her. Got him in trouble. God got him out of it a couple times. He did other things. He was not Jesus. He was not sinless. But in his account, there's only one word, righteousness. And as we receive Jesus, we receive the gift he gave on the cross, that's what's in our account, righteousness. It's been accounted to us. Paul says, God does not count men's sins against them. He declared him righteous. Why? Because he believed what God said. And God then said, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur, the Chaldeans, Chaldeans, to give you this land and to take possession of it. If you'd asked Abraham, he might have thought that of his own volition, he got up and left Ur, the Chaldeans, in obedience to God, to God's call. But we, we think that way. We think God tells us to do something, and we do it, and we think we're doing God a favor. But that's not what God said. He didn't say, you did me a favor, and came out of Ur, the Chaldeans. He said, I brought you out, like carried you out, like we do a small child. You see, God sees our obedience as permission or enabling him to do for us what we need, to carry us in or to carry us out, or to bring us over, to bring us through. 
but we think we're doing something for him by obeying. But actually, we're believing, because believing is the first step of obedience. You believe it, and then you get up and act. And God takes that believing and that action and turns it around and blesses us. God doesn't need us to do anything. God doesn't need you to go and do some great work. When he asks you to do something, we think it's for him. It's for us. Because as you believe and as you step out, he turns it into blessing. And by the way, other people are helped. But that's how God works. We can't boast about what we do. We're like little children that help, help mom make a cake. What was that old commercial? Mama made chicken and I helped. A little girl in her little fancy dress. We're like that. We help. We're there. But God's holding our hand every step of the way. He takes that believing act and blesses us, enriches us, empowers us. By obeying the Lord, that's where the blessings flow. That's where he is. Abraham believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham did what God told him to do, and that's where the blessings are. That's where God is. That's what Abraham wanted. He wanted more. Now Abraham had one more question in the story. It's okay to ask God questions. He's not afraid of your questions. It doesn't anger him for you to ask questions. He'll respond. Abraham said, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? He believed, but he wanted, maybe he wanted assurance or reassurance. reassurance. Make me know it, he said. He believed in his heart, but maybe he wanted to believe it in his head. Or maybe he was like Mary when the angel came to her and said, you're going to have a son. The Lord, the power of God will come upon you, and you will have a son who will be the Messiah. She believed it. She didn't back up away from it. She said, whatever God's will is, but she wanted to know a few details. First, she wanted to make sure that Angel and everybody included knew that she was a virgin. And then she wanted to know some details. How is this going to happen? She didn't back up, but she needed to know how, when, where, what. Abraham didn't back up, but he needed to know a few things. He wanted some details. And then God said, essentially, if you're going to know things, if you're going to come to me and know the future, maybe you need to get yourself into worship. Maybe you need to submit to me and honor me as God. Well, the only way they knew how to worship in the Old Testament was to sacrifice an animal. And so God said, bring me a heifer. Bring me a goat. Bring me a ram, each three years old. And bring me a pigeon and a dove. Abraham did so. And he cut the animals in half and arranged them opposite each other. He didn't cut the birds in half, but laid one on one side and one on the other. And it was early enough in the day that he spent the whole day keeping birds of prey from getting his sacrifice. And just about sunset, Abraham fell into a deep sleep. A thick and dreadful darkness came over him. And then the Lord said to him, no, for certain. Abraham wanted to know, and God said, no, for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. But I will punish that nation, and they will come out with great possessions. What did God show Abraham? 
I think he showed him the whole panorama. Showed him Joseph being enslaved. He showed him Moses bringing them out, crossing the Red Sea. He showed Joshua the battle of Jericho. He saw David killing Goliath. And he saw the birth of Jesus. And he saw him on the cross. And he saw him come back to life. And God said, you, however, will be gathered to your fathers in peace and die in peace. Well, when the sun had fully set, now it was dark, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed through the pieces. I, I don't think anybody knows what that is. People have said, well, maybe it's symbolic of something. How bad it's going to be in Egypt for your children and the light, the torch is going to be a light of salvation bringing them out, but I don't think anybody knows. But one thing we know, on that day, God made a covenant with Abraham. He cut a covenant with Abraham. He said, I will give you the land and your descendants will be more than the stars. The covenant's a serious thing. It's not just a handshake, but it's deadly serious to both parties. You see, a covenant breaker is not only a liar, but he's a murderer. A covenant's a serious thing, deadly serious. If you break a covenant, I'm coming after you. I guess it's kind of like the mafia, you know? You, It's a serious thing. Well, there is a new covenant. Take this cup and drink it, for it is my blood of the new covenant, Jesus said. We did that last week. Our new covenant is not based on the blood of animals, but on the precious blood of Jesus. It's based on the sacrifice of the Son of God. He was cut for us. And by his shed blood, we enter into the covenant. How? By believing. By accepting what he's done. His death on the cross, planned before the world began. Before there was Adam and Eve, before there was darkness and lights, and that whole scene in Genesis 1, before that, God knew you. He knew your name, and he planned for your salvation. This new covenant makes us righteous. In our account, it says righteous. It makes us sons and joint heirs. It makes us a new creation, joint heirs with Christ. It sets us in heavenly places. It takes away the old life and gives us new life. We're trans transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. We're transferred from the kingdom of death to the kingdom of life. And that life begins now and lasts forever. Abraham saw this everlasting life and believed it. Abraham was made righteous by believing, and so are we. We enter into the covenant by believing that Jesus is the Son of God and accepting the sacrifice of his life for our life. This covenant lasts forever, carrying us right into heaven through a little hiccup we call death. I don't know what heaven will be like. I don't quite understand streets of gold. I don't understand a river of life. I don't know what that is. But I know one thing, I will be with Jesus. Let me read 1 Thessalonians 4, starting verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we be with the Lord forever. I don't care about mansions or cabins or anything else. I just want to be with Jesus. If Jesus is on the water, I want to be in the water. If Jesus is in the boat, I want to be in the boat. If Jesus is on the land, I want to be on the land, wherever he is. That's where we'll be forever. Because of this covenant, we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Ours is the kingdom. Ours is all the blessings. Every blessing in this book is ours. Every blessing in this book is ours. I remember as a new Christian reading some of the Psalms, and it talks about these things are for the righteous. But when God looks at our account, it says righteous. Those things are for us. All of those things, every blessing in the book is ours. Do we deserve it? No, of course not. But it's by his gift, by his blood, by what he did, that they're ours. God has entered into covenant with us. God will not lie. God will not back up from this covenant. God is for us. All of his blessings are ours on earth and in heaven. Come to him and enter into this covenant by believing, by accepting his gift. We make it sound simple, but I think we make it hard in our heads, in our minds, in our thoughts, in the culture that we live in. But it is really that simple. Believe it and receive it. I've used this analogy before. If I gave you a check and you took it, you would be exhibiting belief and faith. If you took it and put it in your bank, you would be believing that I had money in my account that there was righteousness in my account. And if you put it in your account and then you went and bought groceries, you would have wild, extravagant faith that there was money in my account and that the check would be good. But we do that all the time. We do that all the time. And we don't think a thing about it. That's the amount of believing it takes. God said it. If you believe it and receive it, it's yours now and forever. We're going to sing a song and we're going to take an offering. And if you need prayer for anything, we'll be up here. If you want to declare your belief in the Son of God and receive his gift, and you want somebody to pray with you, then come up. If you need healing, if you need blessing, it's here. It's here. God has spread his table. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you've always loved us and always will. Lord, we give you our lives. We ask you to be Lord of our life to take over, and we enter into this covenant with you by the blood of Jesus, by believing that he is the Son of God, and that he died on a cross and rose again. We thank you for that. We thank you for this privilege to pray and to speak your word. Open our hearts to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pray that you bless this offering. Bless it for, to God and to the giver. Return many fold the seed that's planted. In Jesus' name, amen.